You're with Katina Michael, guest editor of the special issue on Big Data, Challenges and Opportunities. We're joined by reader in Intelligent Systems at Imperial College London, Dr. Jeremy Pitt, who is the lead author of the paper titled Transforming Big Data into Collective Awareness. Welcome to the program, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Katina. Jeremy, I'm going to begin by asking you to look into a crystal ball and describe for us a typical day of a typical citizen in the year 2020 with respect to what has been touted as smart living. I want you to think about smart devices, smart cars, smart meters in homes, and the underlying infrastructure we've come to know as smart grids. Very good. The, um, uh, the real fear is actually that a typical day for Citizen X in 2020 uh, would be very little different from how it is now. Uh, the trouble is we can't carry on with um, uh, blithely accepting that we're just going to be able to flick a switch and uh, expect to have uh, power delivered to us or to turn on a tap and expect to have water delivered to us. Uh, there's increasing pressure on natural resources and um, we have to actually change our attitudes towards the use of those resources and in particular uh, the use of the infrastructure that enable us, enables us to access them. Uh, <clears throat> what this requires uh, is that um, although we're making great strides in instrumenting these uh, infrastructures, uh, especially with regard to smart grids, uh, there still tends to be um, an idea that this has to be centralized and controlled. What we really need to do is to um, uh, engage users, get them actively participating in, in the use of the infrastructure, uh, and recognizing what effect their actions have uh, on that infrastructure. Uh, and the way that smart meters are currently being rolled out and deployed uh, is not necessarily going to um, uh, help with um, that user engagement and active participation. So I guess here you're talking about harnessing uh, this capacity and knowledge towards collective awareness. Talk to us a bit about that. That's absolutely right. Um, because what we want to be able to do is um, to, to hook up uh, smart technology um, with social networking uh, tools and um, uh, get people to understand not just their individual actions, but um, what they could do collectively, which could uh, have an effect uh, on the grid. Uh, so one example of that is um, <coughs> you know, frequently you know, components in a grid get overloaded. Um, you know, this happens at um, peak times of, of usage. This can cause an outage. Now, when people ring up and complain about the fact that, you know, I'm you know, trying to turn my kettle on and nothing's happening, yeah, well, there's, there's an outage. Um, but the thing is, if people are going to react to like that, we should be able to leverage the fact that they're going to behave to be proactive. Um, and so uh, what you want to be able to do is uh, to, to tell from the trajectory of, uh, of the system, um, infer the state, get somebody to understand the state, and then to you know, tell others that this is the state, if we carry on like this, uh, something bad is going to happen, uh, and then collectively act in such a way as to avoid that um, undesirable outcome. And so uh, here with my example of smart grids, you know, if we could actually get people to say, um, you know, oh, hang on, you know, uh, if I keep on using um, uh, <coughs> energy in this way, something bad will happen. I'll turn a few things off. Uh, I'll text my friends, turn a few things off, and collectively can have something, and the outage can be avoided. That is a so possible example of things that we could do with coordinated, synchronized action of uh, a collective body of users. I think that's a very good example, Jeremy. Um, so we're moving back to a society that can see the advantages of the motivations behind things like sharing and, and bartering. Um, it's almost like going back to a community level spirit, such as a local village, but the emphasis being on, on our neighborhood. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, I would agree absolutely with that. And um, uh, one thing that I, I despair slightly with um, uh, about some social networking tools uh, is the fact that they can only um, understand things in terms of the commodification of social relationships. 
And I think there's a real necessity for us to reinvent social capital for um, the, the wired world and uh, go back exactly as you say of the, the fact that there are things that you cannot um, quantify in monetary terms um, in terms of um, sharing, um, doing favors, altruism, and so on. And you can leverage all of these things uh, for collective action by groups of people. And in your paper, you speak of complex social ensembles. Uh, is that related to what you've just been talking about? Uh, exactly so, because what we want to be able to do is get these groups of people um, being um, wired with their personal devices and for these devices also to have some kind of understanding of um, you know, their position in a social system. So the ensemble comes from the fact that we have um, both people and devices and sensors um, uh, working collectively. And the complexity comes from the fact that we have uh, what is known as a complex system. So this is how you get macro level outcomes um, from the uh, combination of micro-level behaviors and actions. And the thing is, sometimes you can get undesirable outcomes. Uh, one of these is referred to as the tragedy of the commons, where people will act in the short term in such a way as to deplete, uh, for example, a natural resource, um, even if it's in nobody's interest in the long term. But what we can do is by, um, we, uh, we use institutions as a way of regulating behavior by agreed control, uh, greed rules, called conventional rules. Uh, and in this way, we can, um, um, from the ground up, form what are called meso-level structures, these institutions. And we can use this to uh, control the trajectory of our system and avoid undesirable outcomes and actually manage to sustain resources like water and energy and so on. That's really um, powerful, I think, uh, in terms of um, our social uh, surrounds and uh, our issues to do with vulnerability and, and long-term sustainability with limited resources. What's all this got to do with big data? Well, big data is the bedrock on which this um, whole idea is um, uh, uh, based um, because uh, as individuals, we generate huge amounts of data um, in the past, we used to be to have senses which just um, process data, but now we're generators of data, uh, and it's that collectivization of the data um, which is allowing us to go from not just being able to detect events, but to infer uh, a state uh, and, in particular, the trajectory of, of a system. So um, the point is, it's not just uh, what's sort of like known as event recognition. They so say, if this happened, then uh, we should do this. But um, seeing this is the state of the system, and this is the way we're going, we should do this. And in this sense, it's um, what we call it interoceptive collective awareness, um, uh, is because it's not a sense like sight or sound or touch. It's a, a sense that comes from within, uh, like hunger or thirst, and saying, OK, <coughs> we are uh, detecting this state. Uh, this is the situation that we're in. This is the way things are going. This is what we need to uh, do something about it and uh, you know, uh, look after the general well-being of the collective. I, I often hear the phrase, uh, you know, the Internet of Things and uh, a more emerging concept, the web of people and things. Talk to us about some of the kinds of applications, the kinds of data and the kinds of interactions we're talking about. Is it just people to people, people to machine? What do you see being that uh, sort of trigger towards big data early on? It's all of them. It's uh, people to people or rather people to people mediated by um, uh, sensors and devices and it's um, and social networking tools and it's uh, people to machine as well and in particular people to infrastructure um, the, the the big change of course now is that you know, it used to be that there was a big monolithic machine and we were outside it um, uh, then we had small machines and we had an interface to it uh, but now uh, you know, we've 
instrumented our entire environment, so everywhere is interface. And um, this is how it is that we're generating so much data. And will it get more pervasive? Uh, I think so, um, um, but we you know, we have to, to to trust and stop seeing the instrumentation of people as revenue streams, but um, think of its possible transformative uh, impact on society um, through, as I say, this collective awareness and active participation. So we can um, it really do things uh, about um, uh, inclusivity you know, to give people uh, a stake in the system that they are trying to use. Uh, we can, you know, if we took um, generativity seriously, i.e. the ability to create new tools uh, out of old tools, even if the design of those tools didn't anticipate or expect them, um, for people, especially in sort of um, local microgrids, to um, to program their own uh, monitoring tools and you know, uh, participation tools, and um, uh, in this way that we can you know, empower people to um, uh, participate in their um, uh, interactions with uh, infrastructure, and especially with access to resources. Um, uh, and uh, this is, uh, we think, how we're going to um, uh, achieve sustainability because in effect, we have to educate people that they're going to have to have a lifelong relationship with their infrastructure. That um, they're going to have to learn that you know, this is a, a partnership, and um, this is requiring a, a definite shift in attitudes and understandings of the way that we um, interact with our immediate environment. And in that respect, I mean, you, you speak of a, a new institutional science. Um, is that an emerging concept that's coming from your work? Uh, that's the uh, absolute uh, core of it. Uh, we need to understand um, you know, a whole new range of uh, dynamic social concepts and processes uh, and um, uh, have a complete different understanding of what these meso-level structures or institutions are, what we can do them, how people can create them for themselves, how they can manage them, how they can adapt them, and how they can innovate them. And this is this is really what we're trying to um, uh, get at with these um, uh, meter-level complex structures, as we call. So, with complex problems, and we have now systems of systems embeddedness, uh, can we overanalyze these big data problems? Uh, I don't think we can ever over uh, analyze. Um, we should never be knowingly under-analyzed, if uh, anything. The problem is turning is, is analyzing it in such a way that we can do some form of visualization so that we can make the state or the trajectory of the system uh, somehow perceptionally uh, understandable to the user of that system. So this is where smart meters as a, as a channel for the visualization of this state becomes so important. But also, uh, people re require feedback. So we, we have to be able to somehow see that um, uh, their actions actually have a, a direct effect. And of course, you know, one person turning off a device uh, will not really have any noticeable effect. But a million people turning off a device will. Uh, and so, uh, we have to somehow uh, create that sense of belonging that comes from the um, coordinated action uh, and to give people the uh, 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 recognize the, the benefits of what they have done. Jeremy, a little birdie told me, uh, apart from your editorial responsibilities at IEEE Technology and Society magazine, you found time to edit another book. Following this pervasive day uh, is a new book that you're editing titled The Computer After Me. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Thank you. So the the idea, of course, is that um, you know, we have one uh, form of uh, awareness, but actually um, uh, there are lots of different uh, ideas of um, uh, what awareness is, what awareness means. 
Uh, and the idea of the computer after me is to look at all the different aspects of computational awareness and computational self-awareness and try to evaluate uh, its um, impact uh, on society. Uh, and so this, this is um, partly about um, uh, looking at it from three different directions. Uh, one about the more and more powerful computers that we develop. You know, each generation of computer is more powerful uh, than the previous, and that's the computer after me. The second one, of course, is the, the idea that um, uh, computers know more about us through data mining and analytics than perhaps we know about ourselves. And so, you know, it's, there's always this idea, of course, that computer's out to get me. You know? So this is the, the issue of what happens when computers have an awareness of uh, social relationships uh, and participate um, in social ensembles uh, in this way. And the third one is, of course, is um, really about um, self-awareness. What happens if a computer actually has um, uh, a real understanding of, of itself and what it means to uh, be itself? Um, that one, of course, is more science fiction, but um, um, a number of the authors have some very interesting ideas about, uh, about this. Well, look out for that one, listeners. Uh, with that, we bring to a close another Big Data interview, and I'd like to thank you, Jeremy Pitt, for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed.